Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishur. In this session, we will be dealing with the topic, Female Reproductive Cycle. Before moving on to the topic proper, let's discuss some of the clinical aspects. We all know about the menstrual irregularities, the first one being hypomenorrhea. Hypomenorrhea is a condition where we get scanty blood flow during our regular periods. Another condition we know is about oligomenorrhea. Oligomenorrhea is a condition where we get blood flow even after 30 to 35 days. Then sometimes we might get intermittent blood flow that is before the onset of the next period we will again get a bleeding that is known as metroregia. Another condition is known as menorrhagia. The term menorrhagia means you will get a tremendous blood flow during our regular period and sometimes we won't even get the normal blood flow that is known as amenorrhea. So in, in order to understand all these menstrual irregularities, you should have a clear idea about the female reproductive cycle. So we will come to the reproductive organs first, the first and foremost being the uterus. It consists of a body and a cervix. So this is the uterus and this portion you call it as body of uterus and the lower part we call it as cervix of uterus. And Coming to the walls of the uterus, it is made up of three layers, the innermost lining being the endometrium. After that, we have a muscle layer, we call it as myometrium and the, towards the periphery, you have the perimetrium. So these are the three layers with which the walls of the uterus is made. You have the endometrium, the innermost, outer to that, you have the muscle layer known as myometrium. And again, outermost, you have the perimetrium. Now, the endometrium is further classified into three layers or again, the endometrium is subdivided into three layers. The innermost, again, you call it as stratum compactum. Then you call it as stratum spongiosum. But in the diagram, you are not able to make out stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum. Instead, you are seeing a single layer that is known as stratum functionalis or stratum functionale. So stratum functionale or stratum functionalis is actually these two layers together called. The third one is known as stratum basale. So stratum basale is acting as a layer which will give rise to or which will be replacing the stratum functionale. So the endometrium consists of three layers that is stratum compactum, the innermost lining layer, after that, you have the stratum spongiosum, then you have the stratum basale. The stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum, together you call it as stratum functionale because this is the layer which usually sheds off during our regular menstrual period. Now, let's move on to the uterine tubes. There are two uterine tubes attached on either side of the uterus. Let's see the parts of the uterine tube. The first one is known as interstitial part. Interstitial part is the part or the end of the uterine tube which is attached to the body of the uterus. After the interstitial part, you have the isthmus. Then the next part is known as ampulla and the extreme position or the extreme most point of the uterine tube, you call it as infundibulum. There you can see many finger-like projections extending and they are actually pointing towards the ovary so that they can grab the ovum which is released during ovulation. So these are the main four parts of the uterine tube. You have the interstitial part, you have the isthmus, you have the ampulla and you have the infundibulum. Now coming to the ovaries, you have two ovaries on either one on each side and they are actually suspended from the pelvic brim, that is from the lateral pelvic wall by a ligament. So the ligament which 
suspends the ovary from the lateral pelvic wall, you call it as suspensory ligament of ovary. And it is through this ligament you have the blood vessels entering into the ovary. Now the upper end, so we can consider this as the upper pole or upper end of the ovary, they are actually pointing towards the infundibular portion of the uterine tube. And about the lower end, the lower end is again attached to the uterus, that is this portion of the uterus is known as corner of uterus by another ligament that is known as ligament of ovary. So the ovary is suspended from the lateral pelvic wall by suspensory ligament of ovary and the upper pole is actually directed towards the infundibular portion of the uterine tube and the lower pole is attached to the uterus by another ligament known as ligament of ovary. So actually these two ovaries are placed in a peritoneal depression and this peritoneal depression on the lateral pelvic wall you call it as ovarian fossa. Now we will move on to the female reproductive cycles. Usually the reproductive cycles or the sexual cycles start by the age of puberty that corresponds to roughly 10 to 13 years of age. The first occurrence of menstruation is known as menarche and the, it is by the combined activities of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the ovaries, uterus, uterine tubes, vagina and mammary glands, the reproductive system of female tract is happening. So this is actually a hormonal controlled system. The cyclical changes in the ovary, you call it as ovarian cycle. So these are the ovaries. So the cyclical changes in the ovary, you call it as ovarian cycle and the cyclical changes in the uterus you call it as menstrual cycle. So each reproductive cycle will include all these things, the hypothalamus which will be controlling the pituitary gland which in turn will be controlling the ovaries, the uterus, the uterine tubes, vagina, mammary gland, everything so that it will result in a fruitful pregnancy. If the pregnancy is not happening, the cycles will go on repeating. So let us see the ovarian cycle first. So we can see many, many follicles and these are the changes which are happening in the ovary. The follicles will be maturing, will be releasing and finally it will be degenerating. So this cycle will keep on repeating with every reproductive cycle. So the cyclical changes in the ovary that starts with development of ovarian follicle, ovulation and formation of corpus luteum. This is known as one single ovarian cycle. So the cyclical changes which is happening in the ovary starting from the development of the ovarian follicle, it results in the ovulation, later it results in the formation of corpus luteum. And this process will keep on repeating and it persists throughout the reproductive period and it will be terminating only at the period of menopause. And we have already mentioned that this is under hormonal control. It starts with hypothalamus which will be secreting the GnRH hormone that is gonadotropin releasing hormone which will go on and act at the pituitary level which will again result in the release of FSH and LH hormones. FSH it, is, it can be expanded as follicle stimulating hormone and LH is known as luteinizing hormone. As the word implies. FSH follicle stimulating hormone will be stimulating the follicles and LH or luteinizing hormone will be resulting in the formation of corpus luteum. And these are the two main hormones responsible for the cyclical changes in the ovary and growth of endometrium. The FSH is actually resulting in the growth of ovarian follicles which will in turn result in the release of estrogen. So let us see once the follicles liberate estrogen, what are the effects of estrogen in the body? Estrogen will result in the formation of secondary sex characters. It will result in the proliferation of endometrium just before ovulation. So before ovulation the estrogen will act on the endometrium and it will result in the proliferation of the endometrial layers. It will result in the feedback inhibition of FSH. So more and more estrogens are formed, it will actually go and inhibit so that no more FSH is released. Then it will stimulate LH secretion 
So estrogen will go and stimulate the production of luteinizing hormone. So what will happen if luteinizing hormone is liberated? It will go on induce ovulation and after the ovulation the formation of corpus luteum is also actually induced by the luteinizing hormone. And once corpus luteum is formed, it is responsible for the secretion of progesterone. So the effects of estrogen can be discussed in a nutshell like it results in the formation of secondary sex characters, proliferation of endometrium before ovulation, feedback inhibition of the FSH, it stimulates the LH secretion which will induce ovulation and also the formation of corpus luteum and the corpus luteum formed will result in the release of progesterone. So let's see once progesterone is released, what are the effects of progesterone? So progesterone prepares the uterus for receiving fertilized ovum by stimulating the secretory phase. So progesterone is actually released during the secretory phase and this is the hormone which is actually making the endometrium ready for implantation or ready for accepting the pregnancy. It also prevents expulsion of ovum by lessening contraction of the uterine muscle because once the ovum is in the uterine cavity, it should not be expelled because in order for a pregnancy to happen, it should stay back in the uterus, uterine cavity. So that is made possible by progesterone by a mechanism that is it lessens the contraction of the uterine muscle. The next is it inhibits FSH and maturation of follicle during corpus luteum formation. And the next action is LH inhibits FSH through progesterone. So when the progesterone is released, it will be inhibiting the F follicle stimulating hormone. So the ovarian cycle can be just divided into two phases. The initial phase starting from the development, you call it as follicular phase. And the next half is known as luteal phase. So the initial half is known as follicular phase and the remaining half is known as luteal phase. This can be actually compared with the menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle means the cyclical changes occurring in the uterus. So in the follicular phase, you have the follicles liberating the estrogen and in the luteal phase, you have the corpus luteum liberating progesterone. So the estrogen will be acting on the endometrium and it will be resulting in the proliferation of endometrial layer. Whereas progesterone will be acting at the endometrium and that will be resulting in the secretory phase of the menstrual cycle. Now let's discuss about the development of follicles. So the development of follicles starts with the growth and differentiation of primary oocyte. So these are the primary oocytes and the follicular cells will be proliferating around the primary oocyte. There is formation of zona pellucida. This is a layer just immediately next to the primary oocyte. So we have the primary oocyte covered by zona pellucida and outer to it you have the follicular cells. After that outermost the Theca folliculi are formed. Theca folliculi are nothing but the condensation of the ovarian stroma. So the condensation of ovarian stroma around the follicular cells will be forming the theca folliculi. And this is known as corpus atriticum because during every ovarian cycle you will be getting roughly 15 to 20 follicles in the process of maturation but only one will be becoming the graphene follicle which is responsible for ovulation. So have you ever imagined what happens to the rest of the follicles? So the rest of the follicles will be degenerating and that is known as corpus atreticum. Now let's see the changes of follicle or changes happening in the follicle in a sequence. First as we have already mentioned there are roughly 15 to 20 follicles during every ovarian cycle. This will be passing through three stages of maturation. First it will be forming the primary follicle, later it will be forming the secondary follicle, then the tertiary follicle and it will be finally maturing into a large follicle known as the graphene follicle. 
So what do you mean by a primary ovarian follicle or primordial follicle? So it is a primary oocyte with a single layer of flattened cells, flattened follicular cells. So that is known as primary ovarian follicle. A primordial follicle or primary ovarian follicle is a primary oocyte covered by a single layer of follicular cells. Later what happens to the single layer of follicular cells? They will go on multiplying and they will be cuboidal in shape and they will be forming several layers around the primary oocyte. Now these cells are called granulosa cells. Later there is formation of a layer known as zona pellucida. So zona pellucida will be covering immediately or it, is, it will be lying immediately next to the primary oocyte. So in order we can say in the center you have the primary oocyte which is covered by the zona pellucida and outer to it you have the granulosa cells. And the ovarian tissue surrounding the granulosa cells will be condensing to form the theca folliculi. So outermost you have the theca folliculi. So this is the primordial follicle, then you have the primary oocyte covered by the granulosa cells and you have the zona pellucida immediately lying next, next to the primary oocyte. So such, in such a condition you call it as the secondary follicle. And finally the theca will be differentiating into two layers. The outermost layer of theca is known as the theca externa because as the word implies externa means outer. So theca externa is the outermost layer and it is fibrous in nature. The inner layer is known as theca interna. It is glandular or vascular in nature. So these are the two layers differentiated from theca folliculi. Now we can see that when you focus on the uh, granulosa cells, there are many fluid filled spaces in the beginning and later they coalesce to form a larger cavity or larger fluid filled space known as the antrum. Now because of this antrum, there is no much space for the primary oocyte to sit in the middle. So the primary oocyte will just gradually shift towards the periphery and now the primary oocyte is eccentric in position. So the ovarian follicle with the large antrum, now you call it as vesicular or tertiary follicle. The follicular cells which are surrounding the oocyte, you call it as cumulus oophorus or cumulus ovaricus. As the tertiary follicle matures, it becomes a larger follicle and that is known as the graphene follicle. So what do you mean by a graphene follicle or how will you define a graphene follicle? It is a mature follicle containing secondary oocyte and one polar body in the perivitelline space. So the secondary oocyte is actually formed after the first meiotic division because before birth the oogenesis happens in a female child. So but at birth it is actually arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division and that will be completed only just before ovulation. So in the graphene follicle you will be getting the secondary oocyte which is actually formed after the first meiotic division. So when the first meiotic division is completed the primary oocyte will be giving rise to secondary oocyte and this event is actually happening just before ovulation. So graphene follicle is a condition which we will be getting just before ovulation and inside the graphene follicle you will be getting the secondary oocyte. And when the secondary oocyte is formed along with that you will have the first polar body formed and that is seen in the perivitelline space. So perivitelline space is a space just outer to the secondary oocyte. So the vitelline membrane will be covering the oocyte and just outer to the uh, vitelline membrane there is a space known as perivitelline space. In the perivitelline space you have the first polar body and the graphene follicle is said to be the largest having a diameter of roughly 20 to 25 and sometimes even more than 25 millimeters. This is still covered by zona pellucida. The secondary oocyte will be still covered by zona pellucida. So when we take the graphene follicle as such, what are the components of the graphene follicle? 
you have the theca externa, you have the theca interna, you have the granulosa cells and you have the secondary oocyte which is covered by the granular cells known as the cumulus oophorus. So these are the things which you will be getting inside the graphene follicle. Now we are moving on to a process known as ovulation. So just before ovulation, the secondary oocyte will start its second meiotic division. But the second meiotic division won't be completed unless it is fertilized by a sperm. So at the time of ovulation, it will be again arrested in the metaphase, metaphase of second meiotic division. This will be completed only if the ovum is fertilized by the sperm. So at ovulation, you call this complex as oocyte cumulus complex because you will be having oocyte along with some of the granulosa cells. So what do you mean by a oocyte cumulus complex? It consists of secondary oocyte which has entered into the second meiotic division but the second meiotic division is not completed but it will be arrested in the metaphase of second meiotic division. It will be covered by zona pellucida, the green colored thing. This is known as the zona pellucida. So the innermost oocyte will be the secondary oocyte. Outer to it you have the zona pellucida and outermost you will be getting 2 to 3 layers of corona radiata. So we know that it is the graphene follicle which is rupturing in order to release the secondary oocyte but the entire graphene follicle is not coming out of the ovary. A part of it is staying back there. Only the secondary oocyte along with the zona pellucida and some of the corona radiata cells are coming out. So what happens to the rest of the graphene follicle? The rest of the graphene follicle is getting converted as the corpus luteum and it stays back in the ovary. The increased level of prostaglandin level due to the LH surge will result in local muscular contractions of the ovarian wall and that is actually how the oocyte is extruded. And once the oocyte is extruded, it will be floating in the peritoneal cavity. And from the peritoneal cavity, the infundibular portion of the uterine tube will be sucking the ovum into the uterine tube. So the prostaglandin level will be raised due to the LH surge. It will result in local muscular contraction of the ovary and this will help to extrude the oocyte. The oocyte once released will be floating in the peritoneal cavity which is sucked by the infundibular portion of the uterine tube. And sometimes you might experience pain during ovulation. So in the middle of the cycle, some of the kids used to say they are having pain. That is known as Mittelschmerz. So that is nothing but pain experienced during ovulation. So what do you mean by an ovulation? If there is no ovulation with respect to the menstrual cycle, that condition is known as an ovulation. So let's have a view. This is the LH surge and this is the FSH surge. This is actually released by the pituitary gland. As part of this LH surge, there will be ovulation and once it ovulates, it will result. The remaining part which is seen in the ovary will be forming the corpus luteum. So the granulosa cells and the theca interna cells will be actually forming the yellowish pigment, the lutein cells which will be forming the corpus luteum. So the remaining part which is left over in the ovary after ovulation will be the granulosa cells and the theca cells out of which the theca externa is fibrous and theca interna is glandular. So the theca interna and the granulosa cells together form the yellowish pigment. The lutein means yellowish. So the lutein cells are formed which will ultimately result in the formation of corpus luteum. So corpus luteum secretes estrogen and progesterone and they prepare the uterine endometrium for the implantation of the embryo. In the absence of fertilization, have you ever imagined what happens to corpus luteum? If there is no fertilization, at the end of the menstrual cycle, the corpus luteum will be changed or it will be converted into corpus albicans. So let's see the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum produces progesterone and 
when the progesterone production is decreased, that is when the corpus luteum is actually converted into corpus albicans in the absence of fertilization, what happens is there is decreased progesterone production and that is how the menstruation happens that result in menstrual bleeding. So there are two types of corpus luteum, corpus luteum of menstruation and corpus luteum of pregnancy. So what do you mean by corpus luteum of pregnancy? The first 20 weeks of pregnancy there will be increased demand of progesterone and that is actually met by the corpus luteum and later it is taken up by the placenta. So what happens if there is degeneration of corpus luteum? If there is degeneration of corpus luteum, there won't be production of progesterone and the pregnancy won't be maintained within the uterine cavity. So in order to maintain pregnancy, you need corpus luteum. So the degeneration of corpus luteum should be prevented and that is prevented by the human chorionic gonadotropin which is secreted by the syncytial trophoblast of the blastocyst. So blastocyst is a stage be, uh, at which the embryo will be implanted within the uterine cavity. So the outermost layer, the trophoblast is divided into syncytial trophoblast and cytotrophoblast. So from the syncytial trophoblast, you have the HCG secreted which will actually prevent the degeneration of corpus luteum because we need corpus luteum in the initial phases of pregnancy because we need progesterone. So the pro corpus luteum will be secreting progesterone in order to maintain pregnancy. Later the placenta will take up the action and it will be secreting estrogen and progesterone in order to maintain pregnancy. So actually it is said if you remove the corpus luteum of pregnancy before the fourth month that will result in abortion because placenta is not in a stage to liberate progesterone needed for maintaining of the pregnancy. That is actually up to four month of intrauterine period, the progesterone supplementation is by the corpus luteum. So what will happen if you just remove the corpus luteum during this period? That will result in abortion of fetus. And usually the ovarian cycle will terminate at menopause and the age limit is usually between 48 to 55 years. So in order to summarize, in the upper part you can see the ovary with the different stages of the follicles. You can see the starting from the primordial follicle. You can see the graphene follicle which is rupturing in order to release the ovum, mature ovum. Then the rest of the graphene follicle is forming the corpus luteum and finally it will become corpus albicans if there is no pregnancy happening. And there is increased peak of estrogen in the first half and the second half and the progesterone is mainly peaking during the second half which will actually make the endometrium ready for accepting the pregnancy. So the secretory phase is actually under the control of progesterone. Now let's move on to the menstrual cycle. We have already discussed about the walls of the body of the uterus. There are three layers, the endometrium, the muscle layer, the myometrium and the perimetrium, the outermost layer. The endometrium is further divided into stratum compactum, stratum spongiosum and stratum basal. The stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum together known as stratum functionale or stratum functionalis. And this is called stratum functionalis because this is the part which usually sheds during the menstrual cycle. Now the endometrium, what are the components of endometrium? You have the lining that is made up of columnar epithelium. After that you have the uterine glands, tubular glands in the uterus. Then it is also having specialized connective tissue stroma. After that you are having the spiral arteries. You, you can see that the arteries are not straight, they are spiral. So these arteries are known as spiral arteries which arise from the basal layer towards the surface of the endometrium. So you can see spirally going arteries from the basal layer towards the surface of the endometrium. So the estrogen and progesterone produced by the ovarian follicles and the corpus luteum are actually responsible for the menstrual cycle. Each menstrual cycle will last roughly for about 28 days that is a regular period. So in a 28 day cycle, day 1 can be considered as the day on which the menstrual flow begins. 
we have already mentioned that it is under hormonal control. We have the hypothalamus which is secreting the GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone which will be influencing the pituitary gland or the adrenal hypophysis and this will result in the formation of two major hormones the FSH and LH the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone and they will be acting on the ovary. So if FSH acts on the ovary that will result in the growth of the follicles and if LH acts on the ovary that will result in ovulation. So the growth of the follicles with the growth of the follicles the follicles will be liberating estrogen and with ovulation the corpus luteum which is remaining in the ovary will be liberating progesterone. So the estrogen will act on the uterus and that will result in the proliferative phase of the uterine endometrium whereas progesterone which is liberated from the corpus luteum will result in the secretory phase of endometrium. Coming to the menstrual cycle the four bases or the four phases of menstrual cycle can be as follows. One you call it as the menstrual phase starting from day one that is roughly one to four days followed by the proliferative phase which is from five to fourteen days then you have the secretory phase from fifteen to twenty five days and the premenstrual phase that is from twenty six to twenty eight days. So the menstrual phase, proliferative phase, secretory phase and premenstrual phase. This is how the menstrual cycle is divided. So let us see the first phase, menstrual phase. This is the phase where the shedding of the functional layer of endometrium happens. Usually in the absence of fertilization, the corpus luteum will be degenerating. So menstrual phase starts from day 1 to day 4. And what happens further? When the level of progesterone falls due to the degeneration of corpus luteum, it will result in the spasm of the endometrial arteries. These spiral arteries will undergo spasmodic contraction. So what will happen if the arteries undergo spasmodic contraction? There won't be blood supply to the functional layer of the uterus. So that, that functional layer will undergo ischemic changes and it will be finally sloughed off and the basal layer of the endometrium will be remaining intact because it should stay back in order for the proliferative phase. So after the menstrual phase we have the proliferative phase. It is in this phase we have the regeneration of the functional layer of endometrium. Then let us have a look at the growth of the ovarian follicles because the growth of ovarian follicles usually coincides with this phase and the estrogen secreted by the follicles by the growing follicles are responsible for the proliferative phase of the endometrium and the endometrium will increase in thickness roughly it is said that two to three folds increase in thickness of endometrium will be occurring during the proliferative phase and in this phase apart from the increased thickness the spiral arteries elongate and they will reach towards the surface of the endometrium. The glands also will increase in number because all these parts will be sloughed off during the menstrual phase. So we have to regenerate everything just before the next secretory phase. Now the third one is the secretory phase. It is in this phase you have the secretory activity of the endometrial glands because the endometrial glands will be having increased secretory activity and the layer will become thick and soft. The progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum is responsible for the secretory phase and in this phase again the spiral arteries will be increased and it will be coiled more than the proliferative phase. So what happens in the premenstrual phase? This phase is actually just before the menstrual phase and there is actually reduced blood supply to the endometrium in the premenstrual phase and spasmodic pain and spotting of blood will be experienced during the premenstrual phase which will be followed by the menstrual blood flow. So let us move on to the synchrony between the ovarian and menstrual cycle because everything will be going hand in hand simultaneously the ovarian cycle the release of the hormones from the hypothalamus and pituitary, the release of the hormones from the ovarian follicles will be stimulating the 
uterine endometrium. So, everything there should be a synchrony between the ovarian and menstrual cycle. So, let us have a look. So, in the pre ovulatory or proliferatory phase of the menstrual cycle, that is actually under the influence of estrogen secreted by the growing ovarian follicles. So, growing ovarian follicles will liberate estrogen which will result in the proliferative phase. So, during the proliferatory phase, the uterus lining will be re-epithelialized. The endometrial stroma thickens, the uterine glands elongate, the spiral arteries will be growing towards the surface of the endometrium. So, the GnRH released by the hypothalamus will be acting on the pituitary gland and that will result in the LH and FSH release. This usually happens just before ovulation. So, actually when the FSH and LH is released, after 24 hours it results in the ovulation. So, the progesterone, now it is the time for the action of progesterone. So, the corpus luteum secreted by progesterone will make the endometrium ready for implantation. So, in this phase the spiral arteries will again move towards the endometrial surface and this is what happens in the secretory phase. Suppose if there is no pregnancy or if there is no fertilization happening during the secretory phase, what will happen? There will be degeneration of corpus luteum, there won't be production of progesterone and there will be spasmodic contraction of the spiral arteries that will result in ischemia of the endometrium and finally this layer the, pro, uh, the secretory in the secretory phase towards the end the layer will undergo ischemic and it will just shed off. So, there is a, another factor known as inhibin which is secreted by the granulosa cells and it inhibits the gonadotropins FSH and LH. This results in the regression of the corpus luteum and reduction in progesterone by the ovary. That is how the corpus luteum is degenerated. Regression of corpus luteum results in breakdown of the spiral arteries, it results in local ischemia and finally hemorrhage and that is how the menstruation is initiated. So, in a nutshell we can say the pituitary releases FSH and LH and after the release roughly about 24 hours we have the ovulation occurring, it results the ovum. Then after the release the remaining part of the graphene follicle will be forming corpus luteum. The two main phases the follicular phase the initial phase the luteal phase the second phase in the follicular phase it will liberate mainly estrogen which will help the endometrium to proliferate. In the second phase known as luteal phase the corpus luteum will be liberating progesterone which will make the endometrium ready for accepting the pregnancy that is known as a secretory phase. If the corpus luteum is degenerating, suppose if pregnancy is not happening, the corpus luteum will degenerate to form corpus albicans, there won't be production of progesterone, the uterine endometrium will undergo ischemic changes and it will result in menstruation. Coming to some of the clinical aspects, you might have heard about hormonal contraception. So, what is the general idea behind the hormonal contraception? The contraceptives usually contain estrogen and progesterone or sometimes even progesterone alone. So, what are the effects of these hormones? It inhibits ovulation that is it prevents the release of FSH and LH from pituitary. So, if, if FSH and LH is not released there won't be LH surge and there won't be ovulation. If ovulation happens then only the ovum will be reaching the uterine tube and then only the fertilization will happen. So, we need to prevent ovulation that is made possible by the hormonal contraceptive method which contains the estrogen, progesterone or progesterone alone. It also alters the lining of the uterus. It again there is one more action, it alters the consistency of the cervical mucus. So, if the consistency of the cervical mucus is altered, it will inhibit the entry of the sperms. Now, there is another method of contraception that is known as intrauterine contraceptive device. So, you will place intrauterine contraceptive device which contains copper or sometimes hormone and it is said that the copper released inside the uterus will prevent fertilization, will prevent implantation, it will prevent the entry of sperm and sometimes it might contain hormones like progestin. So, progesterone containing IOCDs will make the sperms less active and the sperm and ova become less viable for fertilization. It also increases the thickness of the cervical mucus preventing the entry of sperm.
So the hormonal contraceptive devices are there and copper containing contraceptive devices are there which are kept inside the uterus. They are having different actions and that is how the contraception is made possible. This is a T-shaped contraceptive device which is kept inside the uterus. You usually call it as copper T because it contains copper. So that's all about the female reproductive cycle in a nutshell. Thank you so much.